Hello, fabulous listeners. Thanks for tuning in to Old Bodies Outside. This is your host, Dr. Brian Peterson. This episode's guest is Dr. Lisa Mertz, who is a professor of parks, recreation, and tourism at the University of Utah. Dr. Mertz's research focuses on youth development and how recreation and leisure experiences, such as outdoor recreation and education, can promote healthy development and well-being. She is particularly interested in how recreation and leisure can serve youth from diverse and marginalized backgrounds, and her research has recently focused on recruiting and retaining a diverse workforce as a vehicle to influence recreation program culture. Lisa, welcome to Old Bodies Outside. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thanks, Brian. It's great to be here as well. Appreciate it, uh, the invitation. Yeah, yeah. So uh, what have you been up to? I think you just returned from a conference. Uh, you're, you're doing all kinds of stuff at University of Utah. So what have you been up to? Um, I did literally last night get in from a conference at the um, Academy of Leisure Sciences, which is one of the main conferences that folks in my industry, which is parks, recreation, and tourism tend to attend. Um, so that was really great. I got to go to a lot of different presentations and a lot of them were focused on diversity, equity, inclusion in recreation and leisure spaces, um, which totally aligns with the work that I've been doing. So got a little bit of a refresh in those topics just over the last three days or so. Oh gosh, I wish I could have attended. That sounds wonderful. What were the- yeah, It was great. It was also- Oh, I was going to say, it's also in New Orleans. And so we got to eat some really great deep fried food. <laughs> nice, nice, nice. What were some of the major topics uh, within that DEI scope that interested you? You know, um, there was a number of different presentations that went on. One of them was like super complex, and I'm not sure that I can even understand it at this point. Um, but it was talking about how the government sanctions and allow space to be co-opted by different groups. I'm not going to go too deep into this, um, but it was really about um, the LGBTQ community um, being able to paint rainbows on sidewalks um, and how there was a lot of claiming of space that was going on um, by that community, which is, you know, good. But then the government wasn't necessarily protecting those spaces. Um, so mm. they were getting defaced. Um, and then other communities that are also marginalized were then trying to jump on or kind of take that space as well. So there was just some interesting tensions and kind of, I learned, I learned a lot about space in ways that I haven't really thought about it before. Um, but there was another presentation and I was really excited by this one because the researchers who include Andy Moen, Sammy Powell, um, and Nick P Pittis, um, they were looking at how recreation directors and um, government figures develop critical consciousness. And so critical consciousness is like your ability to think about, to reflect on kind of the different systems and structures that create the world around you. Um, and so they had created a scale to start to assess this. And this is not going to be a surprise to many people, but their research, of course, found that most people who are in a position to lead or direct recreation agencies are older white males. Um, and then, as I recall, and I might have this wrong, but um, people's political affiliations um, strongly impacted or, or reasonably impacted, I guess, um, whether or not they were able to see systems of inequities um, in parks and recreation. So that was a pretty good presentation that I went to as well. Yeah, it's, it's great that there's that hard data, objective data that points towards those things. Um, and there's a lot of data now that points to those things. I mean, it's uh, that data has been there for quite a while and it's getting reinforced and reinforced. And so I think with that reinforcement yeah. comes, we'll be seeing some change, especially in the decision making roles um, where it's so important yeah. to have more diversity. Yeah, yeah. I, I hope so. Um, that's, you know, and I think the researchers, you know, this conversation has been going on for a while and I can totally dork out on quantitative and qualitative research. Um, but this research was quantitative or numbers based. And uh, a lot of times that that research speaks better to policymakers. And I think that um, within the parks and recreation field, we're getting better at figuring out how to capture some of that information, but also seeing mm. where our blind spots are and where we have weaknesses in terms of collecting that data. Yeah, yeah. Well, all right, let's dork out. I actually, like, I think we both love, 
the play that occurs between qualitative and quantitative research. And sometimes I feel like qualitative research actually opens up a lot of quantitative research. Mm -hmm. You know, where it's, um, it's these really deep, deep, deep phenomena are discovered through qualitative research, and then they get quantified and brought to policymakers, maybe through quantitative research. Mm -hmm. I think that's, I think that's true. Um, so the work that I am trying to do, and I'd say I'm continually learning and growing through the process of doing the research, but it's around how do we bring folks, it's not even the right way to say it. Um, how do we ensure that people, regardless of their background or identity, feel like they can access outdoor recreation or recreation kind of more broadly, which might look like being able to visit a park in an urban environment? Um, and from a quantitative research perspective, it's actually really challenging to try to understand intersectional identities. And so by intersectional, meaning um, you might be a woman of color and those two different identities ultimately and overlap um, uh, to, to create a different experience than if you were just a woman um, who's maybe white, which is kind of a more dominant uh, uh, identity, or if you're you know a person of color who's maybe not a woman. Anyway, we can go down the intersectional pathway, um, but it's really challenging to to look at research and consider those intersectional identities in quantitative research. Um, but there are folks who are doing what we call critical quantitative methods. And they're working on how do we do a better job capturing those identities. And I did some research recently and the intersectional identity that I was looking at was um, with, with colleagues, um, Jeff Rose and uh, Quinn Lackey. Um, but we were looking at race and socioeconomic status. Um, so when then the outdoor industry, a lot of folks have said like, Oh, the reason that people of color aren't as present in outdoor recreation is because they're poor. Um, and I wanted to push back on that because folks had pushed on me um, and other research that I had done and said, well, wait a minute, there's plenty of rich, you know, black people and they're not necessarily in outdoor recreation. So I don't think that argument is true. So that kind of started some research and studies that I've been doing. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's it does seem like that the qualitative research gets really hits that intersectionality really nicely. Um, and I, I'm glad that you kind of push back on that, because from my perspective, it seems that um, a lot of the cultural views of uh, underrepresented groups just is not available at some of these parks and protected areas. And so, you know, it kind of uh, decreases their perceived accessibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, Right now, we've been talking about the outdoor recreation industry. So why don't we kind of first off just, you know, talk about how big is the outdoor recreation industry? <laughs> it's big, Brian. It's real big. <laughs> <laughs> so the Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, actually, I'm sorry, it's the Bureau of Economic Analysis. They try to track um, what kind of uh, financial contribution different industries makes um, to the economy. And within the outdoor recreation industry, um, the the, the contribution is $450 billion a year. So like, that's not nothing. <laughs> yeah. um, and when we're talking about that, um, they're using a definition of recreation, outdoor recreation, um, that includes activities that require um, physical exertion, so movement, um, and are also taking place in a nature-based or outdoor setting. Um, so that includes things like riding bikes, which is my personal favorite, um, but it also includes like going out in RVs, um, camping. Um, it also includes the hospitality industry that's supporting a lot of these outdoor recreation mm -hmm. um, activities that people may be engaged in. So restaurants, um, hotels, um, shopping, souvenirs, um, but when we think about all these different pieces that are contributing to outdoor recreation, there's a lot of different folks whose lives are being touched and whose professions um, fall within that scope. Yeah, it's, it's I mean, it's my preferred choice for a vacation opportunity is outdoor recreation. And say <laughs> if we're to go to, say, Grand Canyon, um, I 100 percent benefit from the hospitality industry that is there as a gateway community with the hotels and restaurants and grocery store and gas stations and whatnot. So it makes sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So moving on, um, one of our conversations, or in the introduction today, I mentioned that you do some research within this word called leisure. And leisure <laughs> is a big, big word. It's been studied a ton. And I think that to the casual person outside of academia, they probably don't think a ton about leisure other than what do I like to do on the weekends? I like to relax. It helps me 
uh, restore my energy. I feel more motivated to go back to work on Monday. And having that balance between a work life and a leisure life is important for people to recharge and whatnot. So what is leisure and why is it so important? Could you ask me, you know, a harder question, Brian? <laughs> um, so I, I think uh, I'm an academic, right? And I've been studying leisure for a while. Um, and uh, definitions of leisure go back pre pre pretty far, very far. Um, and in fact, that word is really stemming from um, the Greek culture. And leisure was focused on how people could be their best person. Um, and so the Greeks thought that what differentiated people from animals and other kind of beings on the planet was their ability to think. Um, and so they felt like you needed to tap into all these different types of um, activities to set yourself up to be able um, to engage in kind of your highest contribution that you can make as a person, which you would just sit and think deeply about life. <laughs> um, and so they wanted you to go out and um, learn about arts um, and uh, be physically fit and understand math and kind of go to school uh, and all those different types of activities to what I think we might say now is to be more self-actualized. Um, mm. All that is like distant in some ways from probably people's reality today. I don't think that uh, folks are spending a lot of time thinking about how can I sit on a rock and think deeply about what it means to be human. Um, instead, society looks really different today and uh, the industrial revolution plays a really big role in, in changing that. So what is leisure? Well, first of all, I don't think the word resonates with people, which is what you said. Um, I think we, we hear the word leisure and we think of cocktails and cruises, um, and maybe country clubs, right? Like all of those different things. Um, and I would say it's actually one of the key domains in life. Um, so when I, I work with youth and do um, research with youth, but we think about schooling as being one domain, um, family time as being another domain, work as being a third domain, and then leisure as being that other space. And so leisure is um, kind of nebulous. Um, it's, it can be hard to define, but it's all of that time and space that exists that doesn't fall into one of those other categories. And they're also overlapping. So if you're cooking dinner for your family, is that work or is that leisure, right? Like that's a, a tricky question um, and people debate that. And so there's ultimately, um, According to some researchers, there's six different types of leisure or definitions of leisure um, that exist out there. But whenever I teach about this in my classes, the conclusion that most people end up on is that leisure is a somewhat subjective experience. If I'm reading a book for myself to relax, um, it's leisure. But if I'm reading that book for my class where my professor is giving me a grade, it's no longer leisure. So it's not that a given activity is or isn't leisure. It's really this kind of time that you is like even you said, Brian, um, get to kind of relax and rejuvenate. And that depends on what works for you and what's beneficial for you. Um, and it can involve activities, um, but it could also be a measure of time um, thinking about those that that time that doesn't fall into those other domains. So I don't know. Was that a was that a, a good enough answer for what leisure is? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I really like that you touched on the subjective aspect of it. And it got me thinking of one of the domains of leisure, work. And I was like, okay, like there's some days where subjectively work is leisure and there's some days where work is a grind. I think that's normal for everyone. And I was like, okay, how many days of the week is uh, work considered leisure for me? And I was like, ah, oh, we'll call it three days of the week. It's leisure. But <laughs> yeah, I started thinking about that. So yeah, but it, it, it's really important for societal health. Uh, it's It's got so many mental benefits to it. Um, and mm -hmm. what other types of benefits are associated with leisure? Well, um, I think that you tapped on the into the one that I think is most important, but it's not the only one out there. Um, but it is through our leisure time that we have the most opportunity to connect with other people um, who we would choose to and to build those social connections. And when you look at the research on well-being, the greatest predictor of well-being is having strong relationships in your life. And the good news is you don't need to have a lot of them. Um, what you really need to have is like two people. Um, maybe three, um, who when things go awry, you can pick up the phone and you can call them and you know they're going to be there. Um, and so how do you build those relationships? How do you build those connections? Um, oftentimes, and it, it's through your, your leisure um, and through the activities that you choose to do, whether it's enjoying a meal together, whether it's going on a hike together, riding bikes together. Um, and so this is where kind of some of the different things they say, like um, 
the family that plays together stays together, right? Like that's kind of one of those ideas. Um, so we also find that through leisure activity um, is where people engage in a lot of physical activity. Um, so if, you know, you're not, if, if you're driving a car to work and you're sitting at work, right, you're probably not getting your 10,000 steps in um, during those times. It's when you're out, you know, taking a hike, going for a walk, going for a walk with friends, maybe you're taking your kid out, um, that you're starting to get some of that activity back into your life. Um, so that'd be some of the physical benefits um, that can also be associated with leisure. I look at youth development, and so I look specifically at kids, predominantly adolescents. Um, and what we also see is that kids, through their leisure activities, which involves things like going to summer camp, um, going to after-school programs, maybe going on a backpacking course, um, any of those like range of activities, that's where they develop a lot of social and emotional learning. Um, so developing things like self-confidence, um, teamwork, leadership, these types of skills that really set them apart. Uh, in the workplace when they get there. So it's great to be super smart. Um, but what mm. most of us um, see is that intelligence isn't enough. Um, and so you want to figure out, you know, what's a good fit for you. Um, you find that in your leisure time. That's where kids develop what we call sparks. Um, and um, that helps you figure out, you know, where you want to be in your life. And then you also develop these other skills that allow you to be successful in the workplace because you are good at working with others. Yeah. Okay. You're making me feel like a, a good stepfather right now because uh, I'm sending <laughs> both of my stepkids, uh, seriously, I'm sending both of my stepkids off to one month summer camps in Northern Minnesota this summer. Um, and they're exactly. going to, they're going to develop some independence, some confidence. Um, you know, they're not going to have parents to go to with their, their problems right away. They're going to have to solve those problems on their own. Um, and I feel like that's, this is all a connection to, there's so many connections within this, but I feel like this is also a connection to Jonathan Haidt's book of coddling of, what is it? Coddling of the American mind or something like that. What was the oh, title mm -hmm. of that? Mm -hmm. um, I yeah. And there was, there was a, it's, there's a book. Yeah. But I, yeah. So yeah. I haven't read it. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I haven't read the entirety of it. I, I read a few chapters of it and there was a part in it where, um, actually I didn't, I didn't read it. I listened to some podcasts about it. Um, and I <clears throat> remember Jonathan Haidt saying how he tries to develop independence and decision-making with his, uh, daughter and he has his daughter. They live in New York city he has his daughter go out and run errands around New York city by herself. And she's got her cell phone. They track her on, you know, you can track using like an app, like life 360, see where my daughter's at. Um, she can text, she can call, but they really try to push her to solve problems on her own and not immediately text, not immediately call if she runs into a problem. So, you know, if she doesn't get the right amount of change back at the bagel shop or something like that, how do you handle that situation? I think it has so many great outcomes as adults later on too, like you were mentioning. Yeah. 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 No, yeah, I think yeah. You're, you're spot on. Okay. So moving on with some of my questions here. Um, so with your research, uh, you know, you're looking at these a diverse workforce um, as a vehicle for influencing recreation program culture. And so my next question is, why does workforce diversity matter in outdoor recreation? Just, you know, give me another small question, Brian. <laughs> um, so this is like yeah. a really, this is an important one, at least from my perspective. Um, and it's complex and I'm not sure that I'll do it justice, but I'm going to give, give it another shot here. Um, so when you think about outdoor recreation and recreation um, kind of broadly, those spaces in the United States, um, the conventional spaces that we think of were created by the people who um establish this country, right? And so what we're talking about, at least at the founding of this country is um, white men. And I'm not trying to harp on, you know, white men per se, but you're just thinking about what culture set things in place and what were the kind of dominant philosophies that were going on at that point in time. And so the United States was racist at that point in time and had enslaved people. Um, and so there is a sense that there's, you know, multiple tiers of classes um, and there are some people who are deserving of this thing called recreation and leisure, and there are some people who are not. And so when our parks were initially established, um, they were created, like our national parks, for example, for wealthy um, people who were also white to get away, to get out of the cities, um, the cities which at that point in time didn't have the infrastructure to make them be clean, right? So there was an expectation that bedrooms have windows. And so there was, you know, 
um, we got stagnant air, but people were getting a lot more sick in those environments. There wasn't necessarily clean water. And so there was like, oh, let's find these spaces to get out of town. So it's kind of this retreat. So when you think about that, and that's kind of the foundation of a lot of outdoor recreation and wilderness experiences, um, there's a certain culture that pervades it. Um, and the, the, one of the studies that I have been working on was again, trying to tease apart, well, how much of the, the outdoor recreation culture is about race or um, socioeconomic status or other factors. And um, we're still diving into some of the other factors that could be influencing how these places are defined. Um, but what we see is that outdoor recreation is perceived by folks um, to be exclusive. And we see that there's a fair amount of class associations that, that go into the definitions of outdoor recreation. But we have to say, like, well, what is this thing called outdoor recreation? And so when people are saying that outdoor recreation is an upper class activity, a lot of times they're talking about the sports and activities that do cost money. So thinking about going to a ski resort, right? I mean, I don't even know how much lift tickets cost right now, but I think it's like 150 bucks or more. Um, and that doesn't include your rentals. That doesn't include the gear that Jeez. you need to be out there. Um, and so you can see how there's kind of a certain perception of this particular space. Um, but that's not all outdoor recreation, right? So earlier I, I kind of gave a definition of what outdoor recreation might be. So physical activity that takes place in the outdoors or nature-based setting. Um, and we undermine and undervalue uh, oftentimes the experiences that occur in people's backyards. And we don't necessarily try to create those outdoor spaces in people's backyards because I would argue of this kind of culture that's emerged of kind of an upper class, predominantly white um, group of people who are trying to like escape and get out into these um, wilderness spaces, which are wonderful in my opinion, um, but not that kind of cultural background that has shaped all of it. So I say all of that because if we want to change how outdoor recreation is defined and perceived, we need to get different people into leadership positions who can bring their perspective into the industry. Um, and so that could include um, maybe shifting the racial or class makeup of leaders in ski resorts. That's not going to ever change the fact that skiing is a rich sport or activity, um, but it may start to change and influence uh, the sense of who, who belongs in that particular space. Um, and so when people can bring their own lived experience into the workplace, they can start to change policy. And the research consistently shows that policy um, and very clear and specific activities and actions are some of the best ways to change the culture within um, an, a particular environment. So it's great to do diversity trainings for employees. Um, and some of that training could be what we call affective, um, right? So trying to teach you that, oh, you know, you may have implicit biases or, oh, you need to be more aware um, of the systems that are in place. But that awareness isn't really enough. Um, that doesn't necessarily lead to actual change. Um, so we want to get mm -hmm. folks into leadership positions who can actually write the policies that are going to be relevant to people from their own communities. Um, and while that can go on in ski resorts, I actually don't think that's the, um, the place that we should really be focusing. We should be focusing in our um, public parks and open spaces. Um, and so within communities, uh, trying to make sure that, um, like Brian, you and I once did some work on the Jordan River Trail, right? Mm -hmm. Making sure that those trails, Jordan River Trail is in Salt Lake City um, and it happens to be on the west side of Salt Lake City, which is a lower class neighborhood, but making sure that those spaces are just as clean um, and just as well maintained and that the trails are paved and have signs and have lights the same way that they do on the upper class neighborhoods. Um, and so by diversifying the workforce, right, we want to start maybe at the entry level, but that is not where we end. Um, what we see um, is that it's not too hard, particularly in parks and recreation, to get people from diverse backgrounds. And when I say the word diverse, in this case, I'm talking about people from different um, racial and ethnic backgrounds, as well as from different class backgrounds, but it can also include things like um, people who have different sexual orientations or gender identities. Um, but so by getting them in the door, that starts to create a, a potential pipeline and open up pathways for people to get into those leadership positions. But organizations need to continue to do work to support people um, and, and 
um, really, there's a lot of it is about mentorship um, and about really mm. encouraging folks um, and creating opportunity for them um, and for folks in power to use their social capital to help um, and support folks who haven't had access to those opportunities um, to get into those positions. Anyway, I'll pause real quick and see <laughs> where yeah, you might have that was some a lot. questions. That was a lot, but I loved how you talked about uh, using using your social capital for some leverage, for some change. That's that's awesome. And I also, just going back to the start of your explanation, talking about this conceptualization that was white and male and romantic, and it's almost like you got to go off to this far place to go have this recreation experience when now in our site, we got a lot of urban parks and we saw a lot of visitation to urban parks during the COVID pandemic, which I think we're starting to put that uh, as being done. Um, and then like, you know, another thing that I love that you said too, was, you know, people can go recreate in their backyards. And so I, I gotta say it, I gotta <laughs> say it. This is why I started Backyard Backcountry. <laughs> this is exactly why yes. I was like, you know, like people, it, it, it takes a lot to go travel to I mean, gosh, I want to go to like national, I want to go to North Cascade National Park in Northern Washington, but I live in Kansas and it's so hard for me to get there. I got to take a ton of time out of work. I got to travel super far. And honestly, I just don't have a ton of time nor a ton, ton of money, but I could do something cool in my backyard or I can do something cool in my city. I can go to an urban park. I can, you know, go out there and go hiking with my stepkids. And so I love that you really focus in on kind of some of these more easily accessible places, just geographically speaking, um, where people can get those benefits of leisure and outdoor recreation. So that was a wonderful explanation. Great. I'm glad you, I'm glad it wasn't too much or maybe it was, but you at least were able to hone into some of the key pieces there. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was great. And you got me all excited when you started talking about the backyard stuff. So, (laughs) (laughs) okay. So moving on, Lisa, uh, I got another big one for you. Okay. So what are the systems that support engagement in outdoor recreation? Oh man. So, um, <laughs> one of the things, um, you know, I consider myself overall to be from a, a relatively privileged background, which means that I have opportunities that come pretty, um, easily to me to take advantage of recreation. And it's even helped me get into the position where I am um, at the University of Utah, right? I, I grew up in a family that's got a lot of academics in it. Um, and I would love to say that that's because of my own intelligence and capability, um, but it's really not. It's about the systems that I was able to, to step into and to access um, and about the ways that people invited me into those particular spaces. So, um, I think it's really important. I went to an amazing um, presentation at um, the Academy of Leisure Sciences. It was by Corliss Outley and Asha Brown. um, And they were talking about these systems. Um, And so systems kind of, these are like the rules and regulations that we all start to follow in our lives. Um, And so, you know, if I want to do research on outdoor recreation, I've got to make sure Um, that I'm getting funding for that. And it might come from the National Science Foundation or the National Institutes of Health. Um, But I have to present everything in just the right way. And this goes back to maybe even our conversation about quantitative research, right? I need to have good quantitative research um, to to make the case um, that there's injustices going on and that through different interventions, we may be able to um, address that. And that's a really Western way of thinking, um, this kind of reduction of people's lived experience into quantitative, you know, numerical variables that we can isolate and potentially influence when in fact, um, people's lived experience is way more complicated and way more messy um, than being able to say, oh, um, you know, women of color um, under these particular circumstances will get better access to outdoor recreation. or, you know, youth um, who are LGBTQ when given um, access to safe places where they can express their identity are going to thrive in this particular way. Like it's just way more complicated than that. Um, And so we need to start to look at the different um, systems and the different levels of systems that exist out there that define and reinforce and create and influence the experiences that we all live in in any given day. And when I think about my own experience coming into the research that I've done, a lot of that has been about like opening my eyes and um, listening to other people's stories and um, coming to realize like 
where I sit within this system. This is like kind of nebulous and a little bit like abstract. Am I, am I still resonating or do I need to correct <laughs> myself a little more grounded? <laughs> no, no, no. You, you're resonating. What, I, I love that you took a step back or in that presentation, they had, they got everyone to take a step back from their research. I mean, I think that for the audience that's listening to this episode, when we do research, we don't have, at least in my world, I don't have the opportunity to choose, hey, I'm going to go research this. Hey, I'm going to go choose, I'm going to go research this. I'm going to go research this. Give me all the funding to make this happen. No, we have to apply for a specific grant that has a specific purpose. It has specific research questions. There's a specific problem to solve. And then we have to then present it the way that it is talked about in that grant. And that's actually quite constraining. And I've never really thought about that. So that was, I think, a really good point right there. Second point that I thought was really good was talking about how, yes, a lot of our research is quantitative. A lot of our research is qualitative, but it is good to also, you know, understand that both of these have their utility. They can play together. You can do mixed methods. But when you're representing people with numbers, there's a level of abstraction that occurs. Yeah. Yeah. um, And so... Uh, I, I think, you know, this comes back to this idea that I was talking about earlier of defining outdoor recreation. We have some conventional definitions of what that looks like, and that might involve mountain biking and skiing and maybe it involves trail running and activities that you and I know and love. Um, but it really should be a broader definition than that. I, again, went to a presentation um, by a student um, at Western Carolina whose first name is Joanna, and I don't remember her last name. Um, but she did interviews with um, folks in the Chicano community and interviewed, I believe it was even her own grandmother, who talked about a piece of pottery as coming from the earth. Um, it was a broken piece of pottery that she had picked up. Um, she was making art out of it. But um, this um, piece of pottery had you know, come from materials that were made from the earth. It lived its life as a pot. Um, and then it was broken. Now it was becoming a piece of art. And ultimately, it would disintegrate back into the earth. And that was, for her, a definition of nature and a representation of nature that doesn't look like how I typically talk about nature or my own experience. Um, And my words are often valued at a um, higher rate than other people's, right? Like, I think that definition or that experience of nature as a piece of pottery is not one that gets elevated um, and kind of brought to the forefront so that people are considering or thinking about things in that way. And so that's this piece of systems and having to look at that um, or trying to look at that and understanding, well, why is my perspective the, the right one? It may be under certain circumstances, but it probably isn't all the time. I think another piece um, that's related is that a lot of research we're starting or we've historically tried to look at outcomes for the individual. This kid goes to this camp and develops these particular skills, independence, self-confidence, et cetera. That's great. Um, When we look at youth, um, a lot of times we are looking at white middle class youth. um, And when we're looking at youth from other marginalized backgrounds, um, youth of color, youth from lower class backgrounds, LGBTQ youth, um, we are calling them at risk. um, And that starts to, that treats them as if they're in a deficit already. Um, and then we start looking at programs that are designed to, to help them. How can we get these kids into the backcountry so that they can learn X, Y, and Z skill? Um, and rather than looking at the systems that put them in a position to be what we call at risk, right? Like I'm not actually saying that these kids are at risk. I think they have a lot of strengths um, and abilities that maybe aren't even valued. Like you try navigating um, the streets in a lower class neighborhood. I don't think I could succeed in that environment. Um, And so what are the systems that are creating these circumstances rather than just focusing on how we treat it? Um, And so this is where like outdoor recreation is an opportunity, but I think that we need to look for outdoor recreation in people's own backyards rather than saying that this kind of white conceptualization of outdoor recreation is the panacea that's going to solve all kids' problems. Yeah, and I think on top of that, we should also look at the history of our research. How are these quantitative scales developed? Were they developed just focusing on white privileged (laughs) kids going out into nature? Well, now we're trying to apply this scale to marginalized communities. 
I don't, I don't it just isn't going to work. And so I think that might be another system of just analyzing where did this research vein come from? How was it developed? And is it being used appro- appropriately or is it being used outside of actual its, its scope that in which it was developed? Um, and I think yeah. that's something to also consider within systems. There's a lot to consider within systems. Um, and the it more that is illuminated, is. yeah. And the more that's illuminated, I think it, it, it's going to advance a lot of good and benefits for other people too, and incorporate mm-hmm. different perspectives. Um, and that's something that, mm-hmm. you know, is, uh, is there's a lot of work going on right now to incorporate different perspectives in outdoor recreation. There definitely is. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. Moving on to our next big, long explanation and big question. (laughs) No, I think this one's not as big as the other ones, but here we go. Um, how does going out in nature influence young adults to pursue a career in outdoor recreation? So that one's probably a little bit more digestible. Yep. Okay. So, um, I, and some of the research that I've been doing has been looking at how do we, um, foster a next generation of outdoor recreation employees who are more diverse than the current um, population. And so in general, at this point in time, um, many, many outdoor recreation positions are held by people who are white and people who have um, middle to upper class backgrounds. That's not exclusively true. And there's um, some um, variation, particularly amongst lower class backgrounds in some aspects of the outdoor recreation industry. Um, But in the conventional definition that I do believe needs to be critiqued, um, we do see a lot of folks um, who are white and from relatively affluent backgrounds ending up um, in those positions. So one of the things that we, um, my colleagues, um, Jeff Rose and Quinn Lackey, started to look at was what are some of the factors that would influence um, how someone gets into this industry? Uh, And one of the assumptions in the outdoor recreation research community is that if you expose kids to nature, um, that you'll create future outdoor enthusiasts. And there is some truth to that, but that's not the whole story. Um, What we found in some research that we did is that when you send kids into outdoor recreation programs, um, it does have the potential to lead them to be interested in outdoor recreation, but typically you don't identify who's gonna be your future employees by the fact that they went to summer camp. Um, It's the kid who goes to summer camp or goes to an environmental education center and it continues after that program to engage in those activities, those are your future employees. And so I do some work with folks um, in Utah state parks. And um, one of the things that I have said to them is that when you bring kids out to the state parks, um, what can be valuable is to check in six months later and see who's come back to the park um, or who's engaged in parks in their backyard. And those are your future employees. So yeah, there's a piece which is about exposure um, and there's like a million reasons to expose kids to nature. And so I, I, I absolutely encourage folks to send kids to outdoor recreation programs that are um, inclusive and appropriate for their kids. Um, but just because you sent your kid to the program doesn't mean that they're going to ever want to work in the outdoor recreation industry. In fact, in our research, in general, people are neutral, <laughs> which is to say they don't necessarily want to work in the outdoor industry. Um, they don't necessarily don't want to work. They're kind of ambivalent. Um, so in the general population, that's the general like outdoor industry. Sure. Um, some people think like, oh, no, that sounds terrible. It's like hot, sweaty work. And other people think it sounds great. It's in the outdoors. Um, but we should get kids outside. Um, we should get people outside. Like there's so many different reasons to do so. Um, but what we really need to do is find the people who have positive experiences and whose experiences are strong enough that they would want to continue it after a program. And then we need to support and, um, broker future learning experiences for them. Um, and that again can be about social capital. Um, so the, the leaders in an outdoor recreation program, um, have, resources and knowledge that they can use to help kids who are interested in this space um, build relationships and connections that are going to allow them to get their foot in the door. Uh, And so there's kind of a combination of identifying the right person, which is really about person um, environment fit. Um, So am I a good fit for this particular workplace? And then using one's resources in order to help them see the pathway um, and then build the relationships that are going to get them where they want to go. Nice. Nice. And and does, is there a difference if, um, young adults or children are exposed to 
more structured outdoor recreation versus unstructured outdoor recreation where they maybe they get introduced first with structured and then they pursue it unstructurally on their own time their leisure time um yeah. is there some yes. differences that occur there between the structured and unstructured yeah. And so I think that was the point that I was trying to make. Um, but when we think about programs, we think about programs as being structured time. And when you think about like, why does a kid end up in a structured program? Um, the kid might be interested, right? They might want to go to summer camp on their own. Their parents might want a break <laughs> from having kids around. And so they might send the kid there. And so that kid's not necessarily choosing to be there. But when we look at unstructured time, which is time that falls into this like, definition of leisure, um, that's when people are able to use their own intrinsic motivation to make choices. Um, and so it's those unstructured experiences that seem to be more likely to cultivate long-term interest in the outdoors, where structured experiences might generate that initial interest. Um, but there's a lot of reasons that kids end up in these structured programs that have nothing to do with their particular interest in that activity. Yeah. And it, intrinsic motivation, I feel like, you know, that's really going to drive a career interest versus that extrinsic motivation. But, you know, I was just thinking about uh, kids at summer camp and I remember picking up my step kids. So last summer they went to camp for two weeks and we picked them up and my stepdaughter was crying tears on the way home. She, because she wanted to stay for two more weeks, she wanted the month commitment. Yes. Um, and, um, so this summer they're going for that month and they were, they're so excited for it. And it's very structured, you know, I mean, they're out in Northern Minnesota, they got um, older counselors and whatnot, but um, I know that my stepson, he's always wanting to go and do stuff outside. And he's always asked me to go backpacking and whatnot and gotten him out on his first backpacking trip. Um, so it, it definitely, I think, yeah, it was, it was super fun. I took him backpacking out in um, Colorado um, outside of Silverton. We went and camped up at this place called Island Lake. It's like 12,400 feet. And it was a day that it was thunderstorming the whole day. And we drove up to the trailhead and it was still raining. So I was like, okay, like let's, we got some time here. Like we only got about a three mile hike in. It was about one o'clock in the afternoon. Um, it's summertime. It's in Colorado. Uh, and so, was, you know, it's not getting dark till pretty late. And so I was like, let's wait for the rain to end. So the rain ends. We start hiking. We get a mile in. It starts raining again. So we put our, we have our little plastic uh, $1 rain ponchos. We put those on, <laughs> huddle under a tree. Um, and then the rain stopped and everything cleared up. And we got pretty blue skies and we hiked up to Island Lake. And I was like, gosh, like there's not a cloud in the sky. Um, we had a tent with us, but I was like, let's sleep under the stars. Like that's going to be a special experience for my stepson. Mm -hmm. um, and so that night we had perfect weather, no more thunderstorms. Uh, it was, you know, typical afternoon thunderstorms. They had cleared out. Um, and so that night uh, I fell asleep before him. He was so, he just loved staring at the stars. He said he saw like 24, 26 uh, satellites. So, you know, you look like a regular star going across the sky. And then he said he saw, I think, six or seven shooting stars. And then I know at one point I woke up about two in the morning and I nudged him. I mean, we're sleeping like sardines next to each other. I nudged him and I was like, the, the Milky Way is a stellar performance tonight. You can just see it perfectly. Um, and so anyways, that experience was super awesome for him. And so now he's always like, you got to take me backpacking. He just had a wonderful experience. And I don't know if he wants to get into the outdoor recreation or industry or not. But going back to one of your earlier points, him and I going on that backpacking trip, what a strong bond and connection we had. Like, I felt like our relationship got elevated because of that. And we were, we we're out in the mountains together. We we're vulnerable. We weren't sleeping in a tent, even though you're pretty much just as vulnerable when you're sleeping in a tent, but you're, your vulnerability, <laughs> your sense of vulnerability is heightened when you're sleeping outside of the tent. And he said he was scared that night. He was scared to fall asleep just because he felt exposed. He felt vulnerable and living through that together. And I mean, I felt completely safe with it. We were, we were way above where there'd be any animals or anything. And I have a lot of experience doing that. Um, it brought our bond to another level, which was something that I really enjoyed a lot, especially with being the stepfather. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you just described why outdoor recreation has the potential to be so impactful for folks. Yeah. Oh, gosh. I love it so much. Um, so, Lisa, we are coming to the end of our conversation, but I wanted you to look into the future, uh, into your crystal ball. Yeah. So what is, I guess I have two concluding questions. One would be, what types of major trends do you see in the future? Let's look 10 years out for leisure and outdoor recreation. So what types of major research trends do you see in 10 years for leisure and outdoor recreation? Second question is looking into your crystal ball, where do you, you see your research agenda being in 10 years? Mm -hmm. 
I think that there are some interesting things going on within society right now and amongst Gen Z youth. Uh, and I think that some of the conventional definitions of work that have been around at least since, you know, 40s, 50s, 60s um, are starting to shift and change. And so there are different companies, um, there are different people who are recognizing that having work where you can also incorporate leisure into your life more easily is becoming more and more important. And so that can look like remote work. Um, it can look like flexible work hours. It might look like gig economy type work as well, um, or with individuals being entrepreneurs and promoting themselves via different social media platforms. I do want to be clear that that opportunity isn't equally accessible across society. Um, and so there is, you know, a, a potential a swath of, of folks who are going to have access to those types of opportunities. And I think they're only going to grow, um, but not everyone's going to have access to them. And so consequently, I think that communities are going to invest more in ways to create access to leisure and recreation opportunities, potentially and predominantly through parks and open space and investing in things like walkable communities. At least I hope that that's what they uh, choose to do. So I think those are some of the trends that we might see. Um, I think we're going to see more blended time uh, and hopefully more community recognition um, of the value of parks and recreation. We did see that in the past, um, but I, I'd like to see it come back around and while I'm less optimistic, I'm hopeful and think it would be important and valuable for our communities to invest in these resources and to ensure that they exist across an entire community, as opposed to just being situated in neighborhoods um, where there's money to support them. So I think that's one thing. Um, in terms of my research, I was working on my research agenda just over the weekend while I was, um, or I guess the week flying on this, this plane. Um, but one of the things that I've started to look at are what we call master narratives. Um, and so master narratives are cultural stories that um, people internalize and which shape their actions and decisions, um, perhaps without them even knowing it. And so what are the master narratives from different um, communities about why they do or don't participate in recreation experiences? Um, so there's a lot of different ways I'm coming at that, but as an example, I do research with the American Camp Association, and one way would be to, to try to understand what's the master narrative of why kids go to overnight camps, and how does that align or fail to align with different communities' values? Um, so trying to look at, you know, what are the stories that have been created about these different experiences, and then trying to understand the process by which that story is created and reinforced because mm. it's through those processes that there's levers that you can push on to enable alternative narratives, which are kind of deviating from the norm, we'll say, um, to be elevated. Um, and wow. so that way we may be able to create more access, more opportunity and um, elevate different voices and raise them up so that those different definitions become common as opposed to on the side. Yeah. And it, would this be something that it's like we, we, we include multi master narratives, multiple master narratives into these different places? Well, so typically there's a master narrative within a place and then there's what's called alternate narratives. Okay. Um, and so I guess it would be, uh, you know, I don't feel like I actually grasp the research well enough yet. Cause I don't think it's quite so much as like, Oh, these alternate narratives are become the new master narrative. They might, I, I think it's more of a, understanding of society and an understanding of the processes where this is reinforced. And then I think it comes back to this idea of policy um, and that we may be able to push on different um, aspects to, to create space for these alternate narratives. Um, yeah. So an example of that would be, um, you know, funding programs for youth instead of saying like, Oh, it's okay that kids aren't in outdoor recreation. They'll find it when they get older. Um, creating opportunities and funding opportunities for youth to get involved in outdoor recreation at a sooner, at an earlier age. Um, that's an oversimplification, but I was kind of trying to 
give you some ideas as to how this might be impacted or impact society. Yeah. Well, that sounds fantastic, Lisa. And I think like that's going to be a very um, scholarly rich research agenda for you. I think that's something that's going to be really exciting so. <laughs> and be a good contribution to the literature. So that's awesome. So we're kind of concluding up our uh, episode and today is Friday afternoon. It's getting close to being 5 p.m. my time, 4 p.m. your time. Uh, and so one more concluding question. Uh, so what is your outdoor recreation plans for this weekend? Do you have anything where you're going to get uh, outside and do something? Yes, I do. I do. I do. Um, I do a variety of different sports, but cycling is my favorite one. And I like to ride fat bikes. Um, so those are the bikes nice. with like giant tires that you can ride through the snow. And we actually haven't had snow for about a week here, um, which we've had a ton of snow this year. Um, so the fat bike trails are going to be in prime condition for some riding. So that's the plan to get out on the fat bike trails. Nice, nice. Well, you know what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to go trail running and I have a, <laughs> uh, which is, which is, you know, I love that. And uh, so we have a park that's about three miles from my little city. I live in a town of 5,000 people. And if you look at it like this, we have a river right here, the Kansas River. And the city's all right here. And we got sidewalks. People can walk here. But once you get past the river, there's no more walking space. But the park is three miles that way. And so um, one of the things that we're planning with the city is to make a paved multi-use pathway to get from the city to that park. So you can ride your bikes there with your family. You can run there. You can walk there. Um, and so that's something that is, you know, it, it touches on a point that you made earlier um, with just, you know, making more walking spaces within these kind of urban environments so people can get out and do localized uh, outdoor recreation. But anyways, my outdoor uh, thing this weekend is going to be uh, going out to a place called Mount Mitchell tomorrow and Saturday, sorry, tomorrow and Sunday with my two dogs. So I got the Vishla and a boxer and they have, mm. they're going insane right now. They have been pent up too much inside uh, because it's been just really cold um, and rainy. Yeah. Um, and so we're going to have some good weather this weekend and they need to get off leash and go insane and be dogs. And so I yes. love seeing that. And they do. And when I go running, they kind of, they follow me, but in their own way. And I'm sure you've seen that with your dog. <laughs> Yes, for sure. Well, that sounds awesome, Brian. I hope you have a lot of fun with that. And hopefully my dog is going to come out with me too. So all the dogs Good. will be happy after this weekend. Yeah. How old is Stevie now? Stevie is now uh, five years old. She's a little red healer. Awesome dog. Yeah. Has she, she was quite the energetic puppy. Has she calmed <laughs> down at all? No, <laughs> yeah. she's still like everyone meets her and sees her and thinks that she's a puppy. She is not yeah. a puppy. She is definitely an adult, um, but it's okay. I hope one day she uh, calms down. Yeah. <laughs> I'm still yeah. waiting for that day to come. <laughs> well, Lisa, I am so glad that you came on to Old Bodies Outside. You provided a lot of great quality content and I'm so grateful that you did that. So thank you. I'm um, happy to be here and it was great catching up with you, Brian. And um, thanks for the opportunity to share all the research I've been doing. Yeah, you're welcome. Well, hopefully, you know, after you get some more manuscripts out, we'll have to have you back on to Old Bodies Outside. That sounds great. I'd love to do it. Okay, I'm going to throw on that outro music and we'll call it an episode. Yeah.